can provide you with a lot of information to make you feel more comfortable in talking about climate change with your five-year-old niece or your cranky old uncle, okay? Um, so this picture is one of the most uh, famous pictures in the world. It's called the Blue Marble. And it was taken by Apollo 13 in 1972 as they were heading to the moon. It's the first shot most of us have ever seen of the world. And um, it, it shows us, it, it, it was our first visual depiction of, of how interconnected we actually are and how small the world is. There we go, okay. So when you look up at the sky, it seems like it's a vast and limitless expanse, but that's not the truth at all. This is a picture taken from the International Space Station and it shows the sun over the earth and um, it's, it's actually uh, showing between the two layer la la lower layers of the atmosphere, the troposphere and the stratosphere. So um, it's a very thin shell. Our atmosphere is a very thin shell. If you were to drive a car straight into the air at normal highway speeds, you would reach the edge of the atmosphere within five minutes. So the problem is we are putting 152 million tons of greenhouse gases into that thin shell of atmosphere every 24 hours. And uh, when we say greenhouse gases, we're talking CO2 primarily, but also nitrous oxide, sulfur, mercury, and a few other things as well, methane. So this is the basic science of global warming, and this is what scientists have known since the 1800s. Light from the sun uh, arrives on the earth in, as waves of heat. Much of it is absorbed by the earth. The rest is absorbed by the oceans. Part of it bounces back, is refracted back um, from the atmosphere, and, and, uh, and that's a good thing that part of it reflects back to us because it's kept the earth at a habitable temperature. However, with the advent of all the greenhouse gases, the emissions that are adding to the um, CO2 that's normally in the atmosphere, it's like a thick blanket and it's beginning to trap more heat and, and warm the earth, which has, has bad consequences. So here are the biggest sources of greenhouse gas. And so you see what's moving there. It's a lot of different things that the top um, culprits are uh, industry, transportation, both air and land, and um, power or electricity generation. So here's a, a graphic depiction of that showing the numbers associated. So transportation is at 29% now. Um, it just surpassed electricity or power generation in the past year. Um, so it, electricity could be clean energy, renewables. It could also be coal or natural gas. Um, industry comes in at a distant third right now. We wanted to have a slide about the coronavirus since it's, um, it's just so prevalent and, and it's why we are doing this remotely tonight. Um, so there's a big relationship between climate change and the coronavirus. Both of them lead to health issues, particularly if there are already underlying um, health problems, uh, respiratory especially, with particulate matter in the air. Um, both of them show how interconnected we are. We saw the coronavirus coming from across the sea. We saw it in China, in Europe, and we just kind of waited for it to, to come to us. Uh, we were not prepared before it became a crisis or a pandemic. And we're seeing a lot of the same responses to climate change, because we've known for many years that we needed to get ready for it. In both cases, uh, scientists are not immediately trusted. It's almost as if politicians get more um, credibility than the scientists do, even though they actually have, have the facts and the data behind it. And with both, we know that we're gonna be more successful if we can act globally share what we know and, and work as one instead of trying to operate in a silo as our own country. This is a little bit more um, about the specific correlation of climate change and the coronavirus. 
So last year in Tibet, two ice cores were retrieved. One was 520 years old, the other was over 15,000 years old. Between those two, they found 32 ancient pathogens or um, bacteria that have the uh, ability to cause disease. Of the 32, four were known about, but 28 had never been seen before. So uh, with the coronavirus, initially you re may remember it was called a novel virus, meaning it's the first time we've seen it. Um, and, and now we're already you know, seeing that there's gonna be many more of them. We don't know how dangerous they'll be. Um, but viruses are tricky because they're not alive. They need an active host in order to reproduce, but they can stay in the, uh, a state of suspended animation or stasis for thousands of years, uh, particularly in cold, dark, anaerobic environments like permafrost or deep ocean sediments. So we know we need to be prepared as the um, ice caps melt, as glaciers melt, and permafrost thaws that we are probably gonna see more of these viruses. So this shows um, the am amount of carbon that has been uh, put into our atmosphere. And you can see it really started to kick off after World War II. Um, actually, 80% of all the energy supplied around the world is still being done through coal and natural gas, or what we consider dirty energy sources. As the CO2 in the atmosphere goes up, so do the temperatures. And you can see here from about the 50s on, we've had a pretty significant rise in uh, global surface temperature. 19 of the uh, 20 hottest years have occurred since 2001, and the last five years have been the all-time hottest. 2016 was the hottest of the last five years. So heat itself is a problem. Um, this is a gentleman in Boston uh, uh, suffering from heat stroke, but we're also seeing beyond just uh, humans, it's affecting animals, it's affecting crops. Um, I had mentioned earlier that some of the heat that uh, arrives from the sun is absorbed by the ocean. The ocean actually absorbs about 90% of all of the heat. Um, as we lose ice cover, the, the ocean has to absorb more heat and less is refracted back from the, uh, it's called the albedo effect on a white surface, less is refracted back when there's no ice. So what this is showing you is um, the lightest blue here that has really increased in the last couple of years is from the surface down to about 300 meters, which is roughly a thousand feet. And if you go all the way down to the darkest bar, the darkest line, um, that is 2,000 meters, which is a little over a mile. It's about 6,000 feet. So the um, heat has a, the ability to, to penetrate pretty far down into the ocean which causes its own unique issues. So here's the path of Hurricane Harvey in uh, 2017. And um, at, because it was crossing the, the Gulf of Mexico, which is a relatively shallow body of water that was very warm, it was able to uh, become stronger and stronger because the warm, warmer water means more um, is going to evaporate, just adding more water to the storm and allowing it to increase in intensity. And often with hurricanes, we expect them to get a little bit um, less strong, that we expect them to weaken a bit as they approach the land. But you can see here along the coast, uh, it was still really warm right against the land. So uh, it, it, it was perfect opportunity for Hurricane Harvey to be a very, strong and uh, damaging storm. And the same thing happened with Hurricane Florence in 2018, where it was able to just get stronger and stronger and do a lot of damage in the Carolinas. So here's a hydrological cycle, the water cycle. And it, it does this over and over again. It starts in the sea. Um, the warmer the, the water is, the more will evaporate that generally forms clouds, goes across the land, and is dropped in the form of precipitation, which could be rain, it could be snow. And what we're seeing, though, is that this precipitation is getting heavier and heavier. So when it returns to the land, uh, often the land can't 
um, absorb anymore. It's, you know, kind of like a sponge. And once it's filled up, that's when we're going to see flooding and mudslides. This is a photo of a supercell over Stafford, Kansas. And when I mentioned uh, that the storms are getting more and more intense, you can see by uh, the, the size of this one, um, just how strong it is. So when precipitation falls like this, scientists call them rain bombs. And they used to say storms like this would be once in a hundred years or once in a thousand years. And um, if you remember Ellicott City, Maryland, a few years ago had two once in a thousand year storms in three years. So we're gonna see more of um, this kind of like spectacular weather event, uh, but very damaging. So sometimes it's counterintuitive to think that extra heat can both create flooding and lead to more drought, but it's the same idea. The extra heat that evaporates more water is also pulling moisture from the soil. So we're seeing longer and deeper droughts, which translates to bad crop yields, corn, soybeans, and um, and just CO2 in the atmosphere uh, damages the crops. So this is one of the problems that we're seeing with refugees. Uh, the, their, um, the soil where they are is no longer livable and they become refugees or wars break out because they need to move someplace where they can, can actually live. We know that hotter years typically have more fires so this is uh, showing the correlation of temperature in the Western United States, along with the number of fires that occurred. And I'm sure you remember hearing about California over the past couple of years, their fire season, uh, this is a photo from California last year, their fire season is now 105 days long. Um, so every third day, it, it's, it's fire season. It, it's practically becoming a you know, a half a year event. And often when um, wind systems uh, or climate systems like this uh, lead to a lot of wind, which tends to fan the flame. So it, it makes them very difficult to control. This is a chart from uh, a reinsurance company, an, uh, an insurance company that shows the extreme weather catastrophes that we've had since the 1980s. And you can see that all of the uh, categories are rising. So the gold is storms, blue, flood and mudslides, and then just extreme temperatures across the board. They've all been increasing. And in fact, um, the last two years have been the most expensive uh, in terms of claims made on insurance due to weather. In 2018, $160 billion of claims were made uh, to insurance companies. And in 2019, it was 140 billion. So this is a glacier from 1935 in Greenland. And just like that, um, so not even 70 years later, whoops, sorry about that. Okay, um, yeah. And so 70 years later, it had melted. Um, hmm. That's sunny day flooding in Miami, Florida. There were no storms. Um, that other slide, the last slide cut off a little bit before I was able to finish, but when glaciers melt like that, it causes sea level rise. And in Florida and in many other coastal places, uh, it, it's actually the groundwater that is causing the flood. So it's not anything that's coming from rivers or um, rain, it's actually groundwater that just has no place else to go and it comes back up uh, from the sewer systems. One of the other cities that is um, really struggling right now is Jakarta, Indonesia. They've decided to relocate to Borneo, but Borneo is um, now having fire season. So, you know, they thought they had a safe place to go um, and, and it's, they're finding that uh, they, they're, it's gonna be difficult and we're gonna see more of those types of issues. So here is, um, 
in the United States, places most at risk to rising sea levels, uh, six of the top 10 states by population are on the East Coast. You see Delaware and Chesapeake there on the lower right. Um, and all the blue is what is going to be underwater. Uh, Florida, so this is by population, Florida has the most people at risk at 1.8 million. Maryland comes in number six with a little over half a million and Virginia right behind it at number eight with just under half a million. Now this, this chart shows how, how much flooding has increased just since the 1950s. So the orange bar on the left shows the average number of flood days per year in each of these cities in the 1950s. And, and, on, and the purple bar to the right of it is where we are today. So some of these seem to make sense in a way because you know they're, they're on the coast. So Atlantic City, Lewis, Delaware, Charleston, South Carolina, but uh, quite a few are inland or what we consider inland, such as Baltimore, Philadelphia, Washington, DC, um, where you know it might be a tributary, it might be the bay, but uh, water is, is increasing everywhere. Sea level rise is, is happening across the board. Um, and across the nation, the average number of flood days per year, this was 27 cities they selected, um, have increased from five to 30. In 2014, the Department of Defense said that climate change would lead to food and water shortages, pandemic disease, which we're in the middle of, and disputes over refugees. Climate change is a medical emergency, um, not just the pollution, the air and water pollution, but the vector-borne diseases. And, and this shows um, from the asterisk, the circle with the asterisk, that's where this disease originated and you can see how quickly it spread poleward north and south um, due to climate change and, and, and warming. So this ugly guy is one of the prime carriers of Zika, also dengue fever and yellow fever and um, warm weather is perfect for mosquitoes and it allows them to um, expand their territory. This is a golden poison frog, and he is one of the 50% uh, of all land species that are currently facing extinction. This is going to be the largest mass extinction since the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. So there's a lot at stake. Uh, this photo is of Durham, North Carolina last year. Uh, no filter is on here. This was a straight shot it was there was so much pollen in the air from pine trees and this is happening because um the freezing the frost season is ending earlier and starting later so all of these uh pollinators have a longer time to um to do their thing by 2040 we're expected to have three times the amount of pollen in the air uh, that we'd have today. So if you suffer from allergies, it looks like it's going to be getting uh, worse before it gets better. Deaths attributable to ambient air pollution around the world, uh, it's 9 million per year. And you can see the, um, the darker orange and red countries are the ones that have uh, you know, greater risk. Uh, India, China are the darkest. In the United States, we're in the range of 20 to 50,000 people dying from air pollution per year. And part of that is due to the fact that over half of the people in the United States live in a county that doesn't meet EPA air quality standards. I put this shot in here. Um, it's uh, a chemical plant in St. George, Delaware. Uh, that's Route 1 in the background, for those of you that are familiar with it. This is just below the Pennsylvania line. And in uh, Thanksgiving, on Thanksgiving last year, uh, they had a, a large uh, spill of ethylene oxide, which is very harmful to people and to anything alive, anything living. And I wanted you to see how close this plant is to both the Delaware River on the right-hand side and communities on the left-hand side. 
So this also brings up the environmental justice issues where often we find the dirtiest plants, the most polluting plants are located near um, communities that are disadvantaged. This is looking at everything that goes into the cost of carbon. Some we've mentioned, some we haven't. And the World Economic Forum has claimed that carbon is the number one threat to the global economy. Okay. Now here I'd like to hand it over to uh, one of our directors on our board, uh, former school teacher and uh, environmental scientist herself, Natalie. Thank you, Janet. Okay. Fortunately, we've got the solutions available to us now, namely renewable sources of energy. Here's wind energy installations production and reality. Next. This is what it looks like in terms of a graph. It's an exponential curve. Next. Wind energy could supply 40 times more electricity than the entire world currently uses. Next. This five turbine, 30 megawatt Offshore wind farm is featured in the Block Island Tourism Guide. Tourism has gone up since installation of the turbines. Another positive benefit, the turbine bases on the seafloor serve as artificial reefs for marine life. Did you know that cats and office building windows kill more birds than wind turbines? Next. Solar energy has an even more dramatic story. Next. Here's, here's what it looks like in terms of a graph. Like wind, solar is experiencing exponential growth worldwide. Next. The cost of solar, like computer chips and cell phones, has fallen dramatically. In some regions, generating electricity from solar energy is less than half the cost of using coal. Next. Many countries where there's no electrical grid, consumers and businesses leapfrog old technologies and install solar panels in places that have long been denied access to electricity. Next. Chile is a true solar success story, thanks to its policy decisions. The country's solar market took off slowly. A look at what's happening now. There are many regions in the world where this type of growth and development are possible. Next. In the United States, new electrical generation is coming from solar and wind energy, while coal is just about gone. Moreover, today, producing electricity from solar is cheaper than natural gas. Next. Solar energy can meet the world's needs solving the climate crisis while helping local economies. Next. Battery storage is an essential part of the green energy revolution. These graphs show the historical growth of battery storage as well as a projected growth. Notice that the y-axis changes from three gigawatts in the historical graph to 1,000 gigawatts in the projected growth graph. Batteries allow storing excess solar or wind energy and use it during those times when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. Batteries are also critical for the electric vehicle market. Next. Within the next eight years, highly efficient LED lights are predicted to virtually take over the market. Energy efficiency Energy efficient technologies like LEDs save people money and help to reduce emissions by cutting down on the amount of electricity we use. Next. 
all these automobile manufacturers are now offering or preparing to offer electric vehicles. This is another part of the sustainability revolution. Next. Almost 200 global companies have made the same commitment to go to 100% renewable energy. And now many of them are putting pressure on their subcontractors to do the same thing. This is partly because the customers are saying, hey, we don't want to do business with companies that are not committed to helping solve the climate crisis. This shows that what you choose to buy makes a difference. Next. In December of 2015, at the Paris climate negotiations, every nation in the world agreed to phase down greenhouse gas pollution to net zero emissions as early in the second half of this century as possible. Climate action isn't just about what countries do. We all have to take the lead on climate. Corporations, state and provinces, and cities are committing to reduce emissions. Next, we're seeing marches and demonstrations and demands at the ballot box for the changes necessary to solve the climate crisis. Next, here's the current status of the 2015 Paris Agreement. This coming year, all countries that ratified or signed the agreement committed to reconvene and examine how the newly cheaper sources of renewable energy, electric vehicles, efficiency improvements will allow them to make even bolder pledges. Of course, President Trump announced withdrawing the U.S. from the Paris Agreement. But remember, under international law, the first day the U.S. can legally withdraw is the day after the presidential election. So the American people will still control this decision. Now, let's look at climate issues in Maryland and what can be done to reduce greenhouse gas emissions called for in the Paris Agreement. You can see in Maryland there are many issues. Um, counties near at sea level, record rains, fossil fuel infrastructure, energy plants, and Annapolis being underwater. There's also something nearby called Data Center Alley in Virginia. And I'm gonna uh, talk about that first. Next. Today, we live in an information age. Through the use of a computer and the internet, any topic under the sun can be researched, obtaining written information, graphics, and video. Cloud computing makes it possible to access information from any device anywhere. Did you know that the cloud is not up in the sky? Actually, the cloud is on the ground in brick and mortar data centers that operate 24 seven to provide online browsing, streaming and communications. All this requires a tremendous amount of electricity. Next. The internet is a critical component. Did you know that Northern Virginia is the heart of the internet with more than more data centers than anywhere else in the world? In fact, 70% of global internet traffic passes through Loudoun County's data center alley every day. There are more than 70 data centers located in Loudoun County. Next. Technology companies with a presence in Loudoun are familiar corporations. Apple, Amazon Web Services, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Salesforce. While these corporations have committed to using 100% renewable energy for their operations, most are failing. A few companies such as Apple, and to a lesser extent, Salesforce, Facebook, and Microsoft power their data centers with renewable projects. The vast majority of all data centers in Virginia are not. Next. This graph shows the energy demand by company. It shows the total demand and how much is met by renewables, the green portion. Clearly, Amazon Web Services, which has built 66 new data centers, 
is the worst offender in terms of not fulfilling its 100% renewables pledge. There are so many reasons to boycott Amazon. This is yet another reason. Though this is a project and a concern in Virginia, I thought it was important to share this information with you, just so that you know that when you use the internet, there are climate change consequences. Now I'll turn the program over to the Maryland organizers. Thank you. Next. Emily? You're muted. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah. Sorry about that. I was having a little bit of a difficulty with my phone. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that super informative uh, presentation. And now we're going to talk more about Maryland and how we are going to be the first state to reach uh, net zero emissions. Next slide. Okay, um, so the bottom line when it comes to addressing climate change is reducing greenhouse gases. The most common is carbon dioxide, but there are other harmful gases, methane, nitrous oxide, and hydrofluorocarbons. You can do those, you make these reductions in two ways. One, by preventing emissions, so new greenhouse gases, or two, removing existing carbon from the atmosphere and sequestering it in trees or soil. According to the latest climate science from the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the leading climate science body in the world, wealthy governments like Maryland need to reduce their emissions 60% by 2030 and reach net zero emissions by 2045. This is based on our 2006 emissions. According to the latest emissions data from 2017, we have reduced our emissions 26% by since 2006. That is largely due to reductions made in the electricity sector. The Maryland Department of Environment claims that we're on track to re reduce emissions by about 40% by 2030, enough to hit our current state legal requirement. However, you'll notice that's a different number from what is required to meet the scientific recommendations. We worked on legislation to change the legal requirement earlier this year, but time ran out due to coronavirus. Next slide. To understand how we reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we have to know where they come from. As you can see on this slide, more than 75% of greenhouse gas emissions in Maryland um, come from three sectors of the economy, electricity generation, transportation, and the heating of buildings. Within those sectors, there are sources that are larger polluters than others. Gasoline that powers our vehicles is far and away the largest problem. Natural gas, which is more honestly called fracked gas, also adds up to quite a lot when added up between how much is imported from other states, how much is used to heat our buildings, how much is leaked from pipelines before it's ever even consumed in Maryland, and how much is used to generate electricity at plants in the state. Coal and on-road diesel are also really large sources. Here at CCAN, we've uh, historically focused on the electricity sector because it's the key to reducing emissions in the other sectors. There's a really strong relationship. We believe in the concept of electrify everything, uh, which is the idea that reducing emissions in transportation and buildings will require electrifying our vehicles and our heating systems. For that to work, we'll need a 100% clean electricity grid to get 100% clean car travel and heating. Next slide. Um, but so it's no coincidence that CCAN has focused on electricity and that Maryland has seen almost all of its climate progress in climate uh, in, in uh, electricity emissions. Our policies have driven much of the climate change progress in Maryland in the last two decades. For example, we were a key part of Maryland's participation in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, also known as REGI. Um, the Northeast Cap and Trade Program that is responsible for significant reductions in coal plant operations. We're also part of the effort to enact strong energy efficiency standards that have reduced fossil fuel elect uh, generated electricity emissions 
So between tougher reggie standards and more energy efficiency gains and the recent Clean Energy Jobs Act, which will ensure that 50% of all electricity in Maryland comes from renewable sources by 2030, all of that told will drive emissions caused by electricity down 75% by 2030. Next slide. <clears throat> so with the greater part of the electric grid now getting clean, it's time to ramp up our focus on the state's largest polluter, vehicles. Uh, much of this sector is dependent on federal policy and the international oil market, and right now the Trump administration and low, energy, low, low oil prices are making things a lot more difficult. But here in Maryland, we can still take actions uh, to reduce our transportation emissions. There's two ways to do that. First, um, you can reduce the number of miles driven in gasoline or diesel powered vehicles, known as vehicle miles traveled, or VMT. Uh, that involves building up other modes of transportation, like rail, buses, biking, and walking, as well as building our communities more densely so those alternatives are more feasible. And second, you need to, reduce, uh, you need to replace as many of the remaining diesel and gas burning cars um, uh, with electric vehicles. Um, so Maryland is actually part of a new cap and trade program, not unlike Reggie, uh, but for transportation and diesel. Um, it's called the Transportation Climate Initiative, which you might have heard of, or also known as TCI. Um, and that will reduce emissions somewhere between the 1% to 6% range, depending on how ambitious the final agreement um, becomes. Um, it will also provide some additional transportation revenue, which we sorely need here, uh, for mass transit and electric charging infrastructure, but we'll need to come up with ways to fund a lot more um, to meet our scientific benchmarks. Next slide. Okay, so more than 70% of the progress we need to make between now and 2030 will come from electricity and transportation. But what about that remaining 25 to 30% of reductions needed to hit the overall 60% benchmark? You really can't complete a puzzle with just a few pieces missing. That doesn't really work. Um, so to get where we really need to be, it'll take an even wider set of new policies and participation from every sector of the economy. As you remember from the first pie chart, the heating of buildings is the third largest source of emissions. That comes from fresh gas, petroleum, and a bit of coal. We'll need to retrofit those systems with electric heat pumps and end all new non-electric forms of space and water heating. But we'll also need to plant more trees and take better care of our existing forests. We'll need to reduce methane creating trash in our landfills by increasing composting and recycling rates, and we have to stop burning trash. We need to change the way we consume food to reduce the number of livestock in the state, and we'll need to take many, many more smaller impact actions, but that are all critical to fill out the rest of the puzzle. All of these changes require new ways of managing our society, from how we farm, to how we make products, to how we manage our garbage and sewage. With all of this, sometimes it seems like stopping climate change is impossible. But looking at the pieces of the, actually looking at the pieces of the puzzle, we really see that it's not. We know where this pollution comes from, and we also know how to stop it without jeopardizing our, without jeopardizing our economy. So how do we make this change? Next slide. So CCAM has a tradition of making big change happen through people power. All of the progress we've made has been done with an incredible community of stalwart activists who have shown up time and time again, united in their vision of the future. A future where you don't have to worry about your water being poisoned or your land being taken away by dirty energy interests. A future where our children can rely on a stable climate and find meaningful community supporting work and green jobs. These two images are from two different campaigns we've won. The first was to pass the Clean Energy Jobs Act, the Clean Energy Jobs Act, and the second um, is our first hands across the, the uh, first hands across the, the Potomac event. We actually won both of those campaigns thanks to the everyday people that you see pictured here. However, there is still so much work to be done to make that future possible. Next slide. So in, in looking at what it's really going to take to make the big sweeping change that we need, um, we have done some research. And like many others um, in Extinction Rebellion and the Sunrise Movement, we've been inspired by Harvard Kennedy School professor Erica Chenoweth, who has researched democratic movements across the world for the last century. 
Her research found two really interesting things. First, that nonviolent movements were better at creating lasting change, and that when 3.5% of the population is actively participating in a movement, that movement is guaranteed to succeed. And 3.5%, um, it, it actually it sounds maybe small, maybe large. What that real, what it really translates to in real numbers is 200, over 200,000 Marylanders. Um, so that is really going to take everybody. So next slide. Uh, so we are really glad that you joined us because growing to that site is, is going to take everyone listening on this call and more. Um, we'll need climate action to be part of everybody's everyday experiences, especially when you consider how, how much we're going to need to really enact these changes in every part of our, of our economy. Um, so to take a step today, we're actually going to ask you to take a little action with us. Um, so we're going to send you a link right now. Um, we, we've been talking all about how energy is so important to, um, to, this, to solving climate change. Um, and we've actually made some pretty considerable wins on off offshore wind, um, ga gaining offshore wind in our state. However, we have not seen real enforcement of the wins that we've already made. Um, so we've, uh, we've just shared a link to a petition. Um, and what I'd like for everybody to do um, is please take a, go, go to the chat, open that petition, and when you've signed up, um, when, you, when you've signed your name onto that, please put a star in the chat to let us know that you've taken it. So an asterisk symbol. And for those of us that are just joining us via phone call, um, I'll be sending out all the links and the recording of this video after um, after this presentation tomorrow at some point. So you'll be able to take that action and share it as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome, starting to see some stars. Makes me feel inspired. Excellent, yay, I'm seeing them come in. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Awesome. Okay, I'll give people a little bit more time to, to do that. Oh, can we repaste the link, Anthony? Okay, I'm gonna give it another another 15 seconds. Thank you. Yay. Okay. Um, so now we've got a lot of people signing on um, the petition. If you if you didn't get to it, just you, you know it's okay. We'll it'll still be there. Um, but what we'd like for you to do now um, is think of three friends. Um, who you would like to start a conversation with about climate change. Um, who you think could take action with you. I want you to really think about that and write down those three friends. And what we're going to do now is we're going to send you another poll um, to see if you're willing um, to, to reach out to those friends and start a conversation about climate um, and invite them to our next event. All right, I'm going to leave that pulled up. Just another moment. I'm going to close it in about 10 seconds. And I still see some stars coming in, so thank you for that too. All right, so we're going to close our poll. Awesome. We've got a lot of people saying yes and exclamation point yes um, for those that are def uh, uh, and, and some definites too. 
<laughs> um, we got a couple of people not sure, so maybe uh, during the Q and A we can uh, we can talk about it. What what you need um, to feel confident to say yes, yes, or definitely. Awesome. Okay. Um, so what? Uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, okay. seem to be advancing. Okay. Well, that's okay. Um, well, we can still talk about what we were going to talk about on the next slide, um, which is just some, just a graphic to demonstrate um, that there is a majority of Americans who acknowledge that climate change is real, um, but really hesitate to talk about it. And social scientists and climate communications experts say that um, talking about climate change is the single most important thing that everyone can do. Um, that really goes back to that Erica Chenoweth research about um, that threshold um, for how when when we know we're really going to see um, big big change. So talking to your friends about climate change, inviting them to share uh, to, to take our petition, inviting them to um, our next event um, and and events in the future, and really getting them involved like that really goes a long way. Um, there we go. <laughs> Um, so we really hope that um, you will take this uh, with you and and um, just know that it, it starts just by talking. All right. Um, so that is the end of our presentation. Um, so we're going to jump into a Q and A section um, in just a moment. Um, they'll be moderated by Anthony. 